Um, sweet. Well, awesome. Well, as you can see, <laughs> all right, I'm taking over. All right. <clears throat> The Washington uh, Blueberry Commission has funded me for several years to work on disease control. Originally, this was a look at organic disease control. We expanded it to conventional uh, blueberries. Uh, all of this work was done either in Skagit County or Northwest Washington by myself in cooperation with Tom Walters. So, we first were working on organic blueberries because disease control and organic blueberries is very difficult. I see Richard Sakuma is out there. And I remember one time him, he was saying that uh, spraying for mummy berry, he sprays for mummy berry. Sometimes it just feels like, so he has got, he feels like he's doing something, but he doesn't think it does any good. That was a few years ago. Hopefully we have uh, moved beyond that point. Washington has 8,000 acres of organic blueberries. Uh, in 2022, uh, there was estimated 45 million pounds, but if you look at what is in the ground, uh, and that's fully maturing, uh, it could be 80 million uh, pounds, over 200 million. We have one farm that is claiming that they're going to produce over 30 million pounds of organic blueberries, and they've, they've, they've hardly begun to uh, pr produce. So there's a lot of organic uh, blueberries, 90% of it is in Eastern Washington. It currently is free of mummy berry. I have every year have a debate with someone about whether mummy berry will uh, make it to Eastern Washington. I say, yes, they say it won't. We will, we will eventually know who is right. But in Western Washington, uh, it is production limiting or production ending with losses reaching more than 50%. I know several, attempts to grow organic blueberries where people have given up simply because they cannot control mummy berry. Uh, Jay Scheidt, Oregon State University, has uh, plant pathologist has said, and I agree with him, there are no organic control measures comparable to conventional controls. So there's terrible losses. If it ever shows up, terrible losses in Western Washington, if it ever shows up in Eastern Washington, it will threaten the viability of that industry. 45% of production in East, 45 percent of production in Washington is in Eastern Washington and all but two growers over there are organic. That industry over there is almost exclusively or, organic. No, this is my quote. This is Richard Sakuma uh, quote right here. Um, conventional blueberry growers also have problems with botrytis and mummyberry. A lot of products come on the market with no efficacy data. We have, we have uh, botrytis that's resistance to four different modes of action, uh, and we have MRL issues. This is the the one uh, the one project that generates efficacy data in Washington, and I'm I'm not sure if there's a I don't think there's a comparable program in Oregon. The uh, disease control, particularly mummyberry and botrytis, is the third highest priority of the Washington Blueberry Commission. And again, we believe this is the only public source of uh, efficacy data for blueberry fungicides in the Pacific Northwest. Most of our work had been done west of Linden. It's a product with no history of fungicide use. And when environmental conditions were conducive for disease development, we had good pressure. Unfortunately, as you're gonna see from my data, the last couple of years, we have very low disease pressure. I'm sure everyone is familiar with what a, a leaf strike is, what the mummy berry mummified fruit looks like. Here's another leaf strike. That leaf strike, this is the mummy berry disease. These are flower strikes here and here. Lots of pictures available to us. So from 2019 to 2021, we had uh, what we call the Berry Disease Technical Working Group. It was a group of growers, crop advisors, researcher at Kim companies. Um, this effort was funded by the Blueberry Commission, Raspberry Commission, Special Crop Block Grant. We also got some money from some chemical companies. Uh, Dr. Walters and I have been doing this work for six years. Four of those six years had been during Ferndale. 
Some of the years we, we have no botrytis data, some of the year we have no mummy berry, but every year we try and generate data against both diseases. Um, this is a chart of organic fungicide trial in 2018. This, it is ranked by number of flower or number of strikes. High number is bad, low number is good. I wanna point out the most effective treatment that we had was four applications of lime sulfur at six gallons per acre, followed by four applications of, of OSO. So this was the most effective organic treatment we had, closely followed by regalia tank mixed with Stargus. We also had straight lime sulfur, just four applications of lime sulfur was virtually as effective as lime sulfur followed by OSO. So this is a relatively cost-effective treatment. If you don't mind uh, working with lime sulfur, this is, lime sulfur was, is probably the most effective treatment. It has to be applied pre-bloom. Pre if you wanna increase your efficacy, then you follow up with, with OSO. In this case, actinovate with OSO was effective treatment with double nickel, regalia and lifeguard, and Aviv, these are all bacillus products, or Aviv and Lifeguard are bacillus. This is Lifeguard is bacillus mycoides. Aviv is bacillus subtilis, I believe. I'll point out here, OSO at the low rate did not work nearly as well as OSO at a high rate of 13 ounces. Unfortunately, 13 ounces is a high rate and they have priced it almost out of the market. This is a this is from 2019, the following year. Remember how we had the strikes in the hundreds? Well, the higher the number, the poorer. We had, if you look here, we had 143 in our poorest performing treatment. We had five in our in our poorest performing treatment the following year. That shows you the year-to-year -year variation. Because you see an A through all of these, these are not statistically significantly different. So you gotta be careful about these. However, in these organic treatments, um, I just wanna point out also at the high rate, which is one of the best treatments that we had in the previous year was uh, had the fewest strikes in here. There's an experimental product from Marone. There's another experimental, a third, we had three experimental products in here that we were looking at in 2019. We also had Thea, that is a microbial product. We also had Actinovate, which was one of the better products in 2018 as well as 2019. If you look at the same, let's see, here's another data set looking at, instead of flower strikes, this is number of mummy berries per 100 green fruit. Again, a low number is poor, a uh, high, num uh, high number is, is poor control, a low number is high control. We had in here a conventional treatment to, as a comparison, because we always know the conventional treatments work better than the organic treatments. So we, we look to see how good the organic treatments are compared to, or, to a conventional. And it's always a good sign when the conventional ones had the, the lowest number, but so did Thea rotated with OSO at the high rate, the MBI, also this EcoSwing. EcoSwing is a product, uh, is a gallon product that, that is registered, it's an organic product. And we had it at two, uh, this is, let's see, this is four applications, this was eight applications. This was, this was targeting mummy berry only, this one was targeting mummy berry and botrytis. The, Let's see, this is a program of Rex Lime Sulfur followed by Serenade plus Regalia, followed by a Wilbur Ellis product, followed by Actinovate, followed by Oso plus Regalia, a Wilbur Ellis product, and Oso plus a Wilbur Ellis product. And again, here is Thea and Rex Lime Sulfur. This is a comparison of 33 conventional programs. And again, all A's, so there was no significant difference between the treatment, but disease pressure was very low. So there's not too much that can be drawn from this other than here are some interesting names. Here's Miravos. 
Miravos Prime. It turned, when we did the trial, we did not know which one of these was going to be registered. Uh, as it turns out, it was Miravos that was registered, not Miravos Prime. Um, chlorothalonil showed relatively good, so to speak, um, as far as a low number. Sevia is a new product. I'll talk more about this. This is a, a new mummy berry product. I got a whole slide on this one. In 2022, because of the, the low pressure you saw in the previous trials, we moved to from the Whatcom County site to a new location in Skagit that had RECA, um, the variety of RECA south of Mount Vernon, five miles. It was a field that historically we were going to be charitable and call it and had been neglected. Uh, and we expected to ha have high disease pressure. Unfortunately, weather conditions in 2022 were not conducive for botrytis and were even less conducive for mummy berry. So we had no mummy berry pressure and low botrytis pressure. And we had 42 treatments. This is the largest trial that Tom and I had ever done for disease control. It was a lot of work. We had conventional and organic treatments. Um, Many of these products had surfactants with them. It's the, the, the slide is already too complicated to put in the surfactant. We're just gonna say, we use the manufacturer recommended surfactant for each treatment. All right, this, this is uh, Tom out making the application, mixing, loading, and making his application. If you see a orange color, that means it's not registered. If you see a yellow color, that means it is registered. Over here is a uh, number of infected fruit per plot. Disease pressure is low. If you only have 17 per plot, that's pretty low. Again, you'd also notice there's A's, a lot of A's, so these did not statistically separate out again. But what is interesting in here, as the number goes down, the theoretically, the product is, is more effective. So this is slide one of this trial. This is slide two. If you look at the ones with the lowest number, you have Miravon and you have Circadus. As it turns out, um, these are the same product, same active ingredient, except Miravon is, is a package mix. There was Quash. We have some experimentals. We have an Indar, Prolevo, Bravo, Pristine Switch, uh, Kinja, Rotate with Captan. Here's an interesting one, Astronaut. Astronaut is a generic Zoxystrobin, Bravo, Pristine Switch, had relatively low numbers. Again, here's Circadus, here's Miravos Prime, here's a program with Indar, Proline, Bravo, Pristine Switch, Kinja, here's Circada, some experimentals, Quash, Cannonball, no one's ever heard of Cannonball. This is, the Switch is, the product switch is cyprodinyl and fludioxanil. Cannonball is fludioxanil only. Uh, Cannonball is not registered on blueberries, but I just found out there is a, there's just been registered a, I just learned it just this morning as I was doing some research on this talk. There is now a fludioxanil only product registered for, for blueberries. So, I have thrown out a lot of product names. I want to mention a few products that are relatively new that may have some value to the industry. Every one of these products that I'm gonna mention, I have FCA data to support that they might have a fit for this industry. One of the products I wanna mention is Cinerate. Cinerate is basically cinnamaldehyde. If you open it up, it smells like a stick of big red gum. Um, this is a, the, the use rate, zero, it's 25B exempt, it's OMRI certified, so it's organically available, zero REI, zero days PHI, MRL exempt. Has activity against powdery mildew, gray mold, rust, fire blight, a lot of different activities, a very broad spectrum. It has no residual control. That is the downside. So if you apply this, you know, you probably have, if you're into a high disease pressure, you're going to have to go back in, in, you know, three days. The interesting thing about this product is it also has activity against mites and, and aphids, thrips, and some other insect pests. 
and you see white there's you see white fly there as well. This is some uh, data. Now this is asparagus. This is a European asparagus aphid. But if you look here, untreated. This is untreated check. And here is cinerate by itself at 5.6, not different from all these other products. So, so cinerate, which has some disease uh, efficacy against diseases, also has activity against other against insects. In this case, um, aphids and cinerate in the organic aphid world is commonly used for aphids. Even conventional growers use it for um, aphid control. This is some other data of mine um, that shows um, cinerate activity against spotted wing drosophila. Uh, this is in, in, in blackberries. This is, the un this is the untreated check. And before disease pressure got really high, uh, cinerate was as effective as, as six ounces of Entrust. And so again, it has short residual. Um, we have found cinerate is as effective as Entrust. It just does not have the uh, period of residual activity. Another product is ProBlade. Um, this is an or organically approved product. Um, it's locally systemic, which means it will go into the leaf. It doesn't move uh, throughout the leaf, but it is pre preventative, curative, and erratic. And you don't see those kind of words around a lot of organic fungicides. It's, it's a, an extract of a lupin plant. It's exempt from MRLs. It has a one-day PHI reentry interval of four hours. You can apply it up to five times a year. It's a new mode of action. It's also a multi-site uh, fungicide, which means it's unlikely to develop resistance to this product. Uh, it's fast acting translaminar um, activity and active against both fungi and bacteria. And if you look in, in caneberry on the label as gray mold, powdery mildew, and thracnose, um, a lot of different, um, a lot of different diseases. So very broad spectrum. Another product that we have is that just registered was Circadus. Um, this is brand new registration, FRAC group seven, which means it's in the same group as Boscolid or Pristine. It's conventional fungicide from Botrytis. There's no cross resistance to, there's no cross re resistance from Circadus to uh, Boscolid resistant fungi. I would use it towards the end of the Botrytis uh, towards the end of the season, when you're not so concerned about mummy berry, it has activity against a number of other diseases, zero day PHI. The rate is 3.4 to 9.1 ounces, but I think the minimum rate is 4.5 when you're going after botrytis. I see it also has activity against rust. Okay, this is a, another data set of 12 organic programs. This is um, this is data from this year with, again, we didn't have botrytis this year. We had some mummy berry. Uh, we had botrytis, but no mummy berry. We looked at regalia rotate with serenade. And I'll just tell you that we never had much luck whenever we use serenade. So I'm not a big serenade fan. Um, again, you look at the one with the lowest amount of botrytis. Here's lime sulfur followed by oso. Here's lifeguard. Quava, double nickel, Quava, and Oso. Here's Seraphil. This is a new product. Um, we looked at lime sulfur followed by Oso. This is primarily a, the lime sulfur was targeting mummy berry. So essentially this is just Oso going after Botrytis. Here's Sulfurix. Sulfurix is another lime sulfur product. We put it in this trial because we're comparing it against Rex lime sulfur. Sulfurix, which the new lime sulfur product is not available organically. So this was a conventional uh, program that we put in for comparison. So I want to mention Sulfurix. Sulfurix was a very commonly used lime sulfur product many years ago. And for reasons I don't understand, this product 
the use of this product in the Western US was canceled. You could still use it in Eastern part of, this, of the country, but um, just this year, Sulfrix came back and is now available in this area. It also has insecticide and, and miticide use. You can see the diseases and insects on here. It has a much lower rate of use than the other lime sulfurs. I think the, you use it at the rate of one gallon of, use it at the rate of one gallon. Lime sulfur has a, a, a rate that goes from one up to seven gallons. And so this would be a, um, a, a way to reduce your exposure to lime sulfur because you're using far less of it. It also has activity against you know, insects and mites. I want to mention Seraphil. Seraphil is a new biofungicide. It's an organic product from BSF. It's an 11% bacillus amylo, I always struggle with this, amylo liquefaction product. It's a 10% wettable powder. Um, this bacillus, we call it BA, used to be classified as the same species of bacillus subtilis, which was serenade. In 1987, a taxonomist split it apart, and it took several years for that to find its way into the crop protection world. But this is a similar to Bacillus subtilis, but seems to be more efficacious than Bacillus subtilis, which is a serenade product. And if you look up about what it does, it it is a it does it. Um, it's effective by competitive exclusion or out competing the, the pathogen. So it will, it's a live organism that will colonize the, the plant on the plant surface, on the foliage, on the roots, and out compete the, the pathogens. And it has activity against a large number of genera of diseases. Sevia is a new product from BSF. So, so we have Sevia, Seraphil, and Circadus, all are new blueberry fungicides from BSF that just have become available in the last year. This product is very effective against mummy bear. It's one of the most effective products. It's, it's an Indar caliber fungicide, but it's another group three. We have plenty of group threes we now have another one. If you look up the Sevia label, the Section 3, the federal label, it's not on there. Uh, there is, it's a supplemental label that I couldn't find. I contacted the company. They sent me a copy of it. Um, so if, if you look up WSU on their website, it's not on there. If you look up the Sevia label in Green Book, it's not on there. So this is a registration that just came in. You can apply three to five ounces up to 15 ounces per season, zero day PHI. After two applications, you have to rotate to a different mode of action. Uh, it's not registered on raw raspberries. Uh, the only other berry on the label is strawberries. And again, it was just registered. So I put up several tables of data, some of which uh, uh, came from years of low, low disease pressure. Um, and I talked about a number of products. So the, the point is, what, what's the value for all the work we're doing, which we're six years into? We're going to submit another proposal to work on this. One of the things that's come from this is we feel that we know of all the products that are registered on blueberries, which ones would give a thumbs up to, which ones to give a thumbs up versus a, a thumbs down. That is the value of this work. Also, uh, Kinja, which was registered on blueberries in the last few years for Botrytis, due to the efficacy data that we generated, they added mummy berry to the Kinja label. We also helped get Oso, which was a conventional fungicide registered for organic certification. And so over time, we had developed a good understanding of what products work for mummy berry, what works for Botrytis, for both conventional and organic disease control. So I have this list for mummy berry. These are the, these are the 
do use list. Now, I don't have every product up there. Uh, if you look at a bound that's a Zoxystrobin, there are probably 20 other uh, products that just have a Zoxystrobin. So I don't have all of the generics on here. But if you look, this is, this is just a Zoxystrobin that's tank uh, package mixed with products. There's 20 other ones to say Zoxystrobin. Here's Pristine, there's Inspire, which is Cypronyl Dipinconazole, Vango, I'm sure no one's ever heard of that one. Uh, that is generic Inspire. Um, here's one, Alarity. No one's ever heard of Alarity. Alarity is generic Switch. Oh, there's another generic Switch. Here's Switch. Um, this is a new one to me, Regev, Dipinconazole plus tea tree oil. Uh, the Indar, we have the lime sulfurs, and we have quash down here. Well, I don't have Sevia in here because I just got this. I literally got this label when I was at this meeting after I put this slide together. But we have a, a new, a, a new group three product like like Indar. So I feel comfortable, very comfortable recommended any of these products for use on mummy bear. Now you've got MRL issues, you've got some other maybe label restrictions to, to think about. Um, then if I put this list up, notice how I say may have efficacy. So these are organically approved, mummy bears on a label, they may have efficacy. There are a lot of things that did not make this list. There are a few things as I look at this should be on the list. Like I see Oso should be on this list. I don't have Oso, but these are the products that may have activity, may have activity. It makes me nervous putting this list up here because I have plenty of confidence in these products. May have FC. So I'm gonna pause there and we have plenty of time for questions. I'm actually three minutes ahead of schedule. So I'm gonna pause there and take any questions or if anybody wants to argue with me. Questions? Richard, I'm gonna make you ask me a question What's a product that you use that's not on this list? What? Jet Ag and Oxidate. Okay, okay, okay. I did the search on mummy berry. Um, so you're talking about Jet Ag and Oxidate. Um, I, I don't know that I've tested those for mummy bear. I know that they have activity against botrytis. Uh, they're equivalent products. They're uh, parasitic acid perfectly good products. They have zero day, zero residual. So those are good. They also have activity against spotted ring drosophila. I wouldn't call them a standalone product. The other thing that's on there is uh, I don't have the, I don't have EcoSwing on here and I'm not sure. I see Gallon back there. EcoSwing has activity against botrytis, but it has activity against mummy berry too. Is that correct? You're right. So EcoSwing could be on this list as well. What do you got? We've done some trials, Alan, but most of them tend with lots of glass and shreds. Okay. Okay, someone asked me a question or add something for the good of the cause. I'm gonna start asking you guys questions. Take that back to Tom Walters. So Tom, he's in the back there. He's in the back. Tom, Add some comment content for me on this. Comment. Okay. I guess the comment that I'd add is that for a long time we've had pretty decent results on mummy berry with lime sulfur early and a high rate of oso late. And you mentioned that I know, but I just wanted to add that it's been consistent year after year after year. That, that is one of the most consistent things. Lime sulfur early, also at a high rate later with the emphasis on lime sulfur early. Um, the other thing I'll mention is fun Tom and I to do research on this and disease pressure will be low. 
Yes. I had one thing. So, by the way, just fun fact, the number one complaint for drip is for lime salt for apple. Granted, most of that is for you know, large scale applications over on the east side, but um, it is something you've got to be very careful with drip about when you're applying. So it smells, so people, people know about it. And it's caustic, so it gets on things that can it can burn them. So, so how do you know that that's the number one complaint? Is lime sulfur application okay? Overwhelming lime sulfur. The overwhelming use of lime sulfur is as a blossom thinner in apples. That's uh, there's that use is bigger than all other uses combined. Blossom thinning in apples on the east side. But how do you know that it's one of the most commonly implicated? products in drift because um at washington friends of farms and forests you know, we got some reports from washington state department of health on pesticide drift because that's routinely a big issue a lot of times with bills uh that that deal with uh farm worker production drift issues things like that and so the department of health has to write up these reports on you know what are the primary sources and every year, uh, lime sulfur is thinner. It's gone. Uh, okay. And it, like you say, it's just so noticeable. People know when there's been a uh, drip event. And they even know when there hasn't been a drip event. Okay. So the, the smell, it's caustic in nature. And the other thing is, is this method of application is by air blast, which is a little harder to control where it goes. Okay. All right. Anyone else have a question or some inf information for the good of the cause? Yes, sir. Mr. Gill. What's the role of phytophthora on drip irrigation? In a phytophthora? Um, so if, I, if you're if we're saying the same thing, phytophthora, the root, the root disease, that is a that is a pest of raspberries to my knowledge. It's not well known or well thought of uh, as a pathogen in blueberries. I see Lisa Jones back there. You walked in at the wrong time. Are you aware of phytophthora being a significant disease in blueberries? Can you have her say it in the microphone. I know it is a. It can be a significant in blueberries. I haven't heard a lot of. Um, when you say it can be, are you talking about in this location or you heard of it from in other areas? In other areas. Okay. So Phytophthora is a, you know, it's okay, it's it's a genera of of fungi, like you know, it's it's late blight in potatoes, it's root rot in raspberries. It would probably be a root rot in blueberries, how it would show up. I've not heard of anyone saying that's a problem around here. It's not come to us as a problem. It's not a research priority. So that's all. I don't know anything. That's all I know. All right. Yeah, that's great. I think we're good. All right, yeah, thank we're, you. We're good on time. Thank you so much, Alan. Awesome. We have a little bit of um, technical rejiggering to do uh, for our next speaker. So while we try and take care of that, I want to say there are some spots for folks in the back. There are quite a few spots up here in front, not to put you on the spot, um, but there's quite a few seats up front. We are going to add some more chairs so that we have a little more elbow room in here for everybody. Um, yeah, uh, this might take just a quick second. But um, so yeah, after uh, this talk here, we're gonna head into a break and then you'll come back here into the CHS room for our keynote session with Rick Larson. And then we'll head to lunch, which I know is always a hit. <laughs>